Jesus was God in the flesh. Though he was God in the flesh, we know from places like Hebrews chapter 5, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience. And he learned those, that obedience through the things which he suffered. Jesus was one who was humble and went about his life wanting to do the, the will of his Father. And because of that, he becomes not just uh, verifiably the Son of God, but for us to recognize the example that he set for us as being that Son of God. Because he was obedient in everything. Even those things that we might say, well, why would he need to be obedient in something like that when it wasn't anything that was really necessary for him to do, such as being baptized? Was it actually necessary for him to be baptized? Uh, so we're going to be looking at that. Beginnings as well. It's very significant in my mind that Jesus begins his ministry at this particular moment of time, as we'll see from the different gospel accounts, that this was something that the Father says that he was well pleased with the Son and yet the son has not done anything in his ministry as of yet other than being baptized. And I think there's some significance to that as well. So those are the th things we're going to be focusing on this morning. So first let's understand what was John's baptism. When you think about John the Baptist and him coming up until this time, you have John who's out in the wilderness. He's kind of dressed in a kind of crazy way to a lot of people. But they also recognize that this is sort of the way that the prophets of old presented themselves. And the Bible lets us know that this is the spirit of Elijah that was prophesied to come, that he was going to make straight the paths of the Lord. And as he's out there preaching in the wilderness, and he's been preaching for about six months now, and he's out there preaching and teaching and multitudes from Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, all these different areas, they're coming down and they're listening to this message that John is preaching about repentance and turning your hearts back to God. And as he's preaching and teaching, even in Matthew's account earlier in, in uh, Matthew chapter 3, it talks about the, the Pharisees coming out and some of these other religious leaders coming out. And they come out to John the Baptist. And John asked them a question and said, Well, who warned you to come out here about these things? Don't think that you can say to yourselves that we have Abraham as our father because God is able to raise it from the stones to send us to Abraham. But you're supposed to bear fruits that are worthy of repentance. Don't be hypocritical, don't be pretending that if you're coming out here to receive this baptism, it's because you are truly repenting and turning back to God. But it wasn't just that. But at this moment of time when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, God the Father breaks about 1,500 years of silence where he has not spoken as this. He had spoke through prophets, he had spoke through angels, the Spirit had given understanding and words to many, but God the Father had not spoken like this. And he breaks that silence at this moment of time. When John was out there in the wilderness and he was preaching, what he was preaching and teaching and in this baptism was a baptism of, of expectation of what was going to be coming. It was never intended and ne not meant to be the final. And we know that because we know that John's baptism is not the baptism that we submit to today. But it was a baptism of expectation on what was going to be coming. Let's go to John's account of this. In John chapter 1, John really never mentions the baptism itself. But John gives us information about some of the things that were surrounding John the Baptist and his baptism and his preaching and his teaching at this time. John chapter 1. And note verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Proclaiming this idea that he was going to prepare the way for the one who was coming. He reiterates this again in verse, and makes it more clear in verses 31 through 34, where he says, I did not know him, but that he should be this Messiah, this Savior, that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. And I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Another passage that we can go to is in the book of Acts, where Paul comes upon these disciples who had not yet been baptized in the name of Jesus. And he knows this because they had not received the, these uh, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so he asked them the question about what baptism they had obeyed, and they say it was John's baptism. In verse 4, Paul says to them, Jesus, or John rather, indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance. And notice what he was saying as he was baptizing. 
saying to the people that they should believe on him who would to come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When John was out there baptizing people and converting people to be his disciples, as we sometimes refer to it as, as being, John was teaching them that there was going to be someone else who was coming, someone who was greater and mightier than he. John himself said that he must decrease while Jesus increases. John says of himself that I am not worthy to even set da uh, kneel down and to strap the sandals on his feet. And so John knows why he's baptizing. And when he sees Jesus coming, he knows Jesus does not meet the criteria. He's baptizing for forgiveness of sins, for repentance. And Jesus wants to be baptized? It's amazing that when John is baptizing, he does preach to the people, and we saw this in Acts 19, 4 a moment ago, that it was a baptism for repentance. And Jesus is coming to him? What would Jesus have to be in, in need of repentance of? Is he the Messiah? John says, I didn't recognize him. It doesn't mean that he didn't recognize him as being his cousin, recognize him as being the one that he knew that all these different promises were made about him. But this is in a very strange way that Jesus is coming to John because this baptism was so that people might make the proclamation that I am repenting, I am changing, I am forsaking not just my sinful path, but John is preaching that this is the way that makes straight the ways of the Lord, that I'm going to believe on the one who is yet to come. And Jesus comes to be baptized? It doesn't make a lot of sense to John, and you can understand why he then tries to prevent him from doing so. Because not only does he say it's for repentance, but he also does say that it's for the remission of sins, which is a remarkable thing to talk about. And it's one that maybe sometimes we get confused about. John does say that his baptism is for remission of sins, but how so? In Mark 1, I want us to look at a few things concerning this. In Mark's account, and I, and I really like how Mark describes this one particular scene. Mark chapter 1. <clears throat> and we're going to look at this more, especially when we get down to verse 10 in this chapter. But think how John says this, or Mark says this. John came baptizing in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Same phrase that we have in places like Acts chapter 2 and other places. It is for the remission of sins. But we know from other passages like Hebrews 9 and verse 15 that Jesus came as the mediator of a new covenant and that it was with his own blood. Hebrews 9 talks about it's not with the, the blood of bulls and goats that a person's sins can be washed away. It was only going to be through the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ being spilt. And Jesus has not yet spilt it. But we also see in Hebrews 9 and verse uh, 15 that it talks about that this is for the remission of the sins of those that were committed under the first covenant as well. You've probably heard the expression before how the blood of Jesus flows not just forward but also backward. That those people in the Old Testament, even when they offered animal sacrifices, it was said they were offering them for the forgiveness or for the remission of their sins. And yet we know that in reality their sins were not yet forgiven because it was in prospect that John was saying to these people to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins because of the one who is coming. Not because of himself, but for the one who was coming. To believe on him who would be able to take away these sins. Make yourselves ready for the arrival of the king. Make yourselves ready for the Messiah. Make yourselves ready for the one in whom your sins can be forgiven because God has been silent for all these years. Bulls and goats have been sacrificed for centuries. Now's the time. He is at hand. That message would have resonated so strongly with those who understood the Old Testament prophecies, who looked forward to the, the, the reality of sins being forgiven and not a rolling forward. And what a glorious moment it was when Jesus, in the midst of that multitude, comes to obey this commandment that was given by John the Baptist to, to be baptized. But again, what repentance, what forgiveness of sins was there for Jesus? And we know that there is none. But it was a baptism that was to be obeyed, not just because of the result but because the action itself was obedience and humility. Think about how it would be today if we were to say, you know, Jesus commanded everyone to be baptized 
for the forgiveness of their sins. And they say, well, Jesus never obeyed that command. Or Jesus' disciples going and saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. Be baptized. Re repent. And they say, well, your master never did it. Think about a passage like Luke chapter 7 because Jesus does get into discussions with many religious leaders about this very thing, this baptism of, of John. John uh, Luke chapter 7, <clears throat> verses 29 and 30. In this discussion that Jesus is having with the religious leaders, it says in verse 29, And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors, justified God having been baptized with the baptism of John. But notice in verse 30, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. By not doing something that God expected, they're rejecting God's will. And many of the religious leaders rejected the will of God by simply refusing to be baptized with the baptism of John. You also have in Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 27, that Jesus again is in a discussion with religious leaders and they come to him and they're asking him, by what authority are you doing all these things and who is it that gave you this authority? And Jesus asked them a question. He says, I'll ask you something. You answer my question, I'll answer yours. Baptism of John, where was it from, heaven or men? And they began to discuss amongst themselves, if we say it was from men, you know, everybody thinks John's a prophet, that'd get us into a lot of trouble. But if we say... It's from God. The, uh, the logical question would be, so why then did you not do it? And so when we talk about baptism today, and here's a parallel that we can draw to today. It's not John's baptism. It's the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Is it from heaven or is it from men? Who invented it? Who came up with it? Because if it's from God, then why then have you not obeyed it? Why then would someone reject it? And by rejecting, you can understand that you are rejecting the will of God for yourself. Because that's the means that God gave that a person might be forgiven of their sins. Jesus didn't need forgiveness of sins. There was nothing for him to repent of. But this was the will of God for all of mankind to do this thing. And it's exactly what Jesus did. And really, it's as simple as that. This was a baptism that was meant to be obeyed. So why was it then that Jesus himself was baptized? Jesus gives us the answer very simply in Matthew 3 and verse 15 when he says to fulfill all righteousness. It was the right thing to do. The word righteousness, and we've kind of looked at this as we've been doing our Words from the Word series this, this year. Righteousness is the idea of the right doing this, doing what is right in the sight of God. But really it carries a much deeper meaning than that because righteousness is really about someone fulfilling their end of an obligation or their, their side of a covenant, their side of an agreement that I have done right. This is the thing that was said for you to do and for me to do and I have done my part. I have done what was right. It's interesting the language that's used there between John the Baptist and Jesus and that when they're talking about this, there's words like permitted, there's words like uh, forbade, there's words like prevent. And these words that are in the gospel accounts of Jesus' baptism all convey something that maybe we miss, is that this was not just, I don't think this ought to happen, but John was saying, absolutely not. John's saying, no way. As Jesus comes down into the water to, to meet John, John says, this isn't going to happen. I'm not doing this. And basically the scene there is Jesus getting into the water with John the Baptist. Imagine two people getting into the, the baptistry here and there's an argument that breaks out between the two of them. And that's what happens here. And John's saying, I'm not worthy to loose the, the, the straps of your sandals. I'm the one who needs to be baptized of you, not you from me. And Jesus has to say, Please allow it for now, because this is what is needed. This is what is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. There are times where maybe we don't feel worthy in situations. There are times where we may not always see, well, what is the, what's the need of this, and how can this be beneficial to someone? How can this even make a difference? Jesus didn't need to be baptized for forgiveness of sins, so what was the difference? What was the need of that? We look at it as it's just a small thing that I can do for another person. It's really not going to make a difference, is it? Is it really going to be that important, that big a deal? 
Jesus says, if you see someone is hungry, you feed them. If they're thirsty, you give them a drink of water. And believe me, to someone who is thirsty, a, a cup of cool water goes a long way and means a lot. That's why Jesus says, if you do that in the name of a disciple, you, you, you'll receive a disciple's reward. Jesus was fulfilling all righteousness. In Hebrews 10 and verse 7, it reminds us that in the volumes of the book of old it is written, I have come to do your will. And that's what we're all striving to do. Just, Father, what is it that you want me to do? You have kept up your end of this agreement and that you have given me a means of grace and access to you. And I've received from you salvation. My end of the agreement is to live faithfully, to walk in righteousness, to do what is right. Not because I necessarily see that there's going to be some grandiose blessing that's, that's given to me by the act or that I think that maybe it makes a big deal if I do it or not do it, but to fulfill all righteousness. Father, this is what I'm, I'm supposed to do. Because in reality, it wasn't that Jesus was about doing the things that were righteous, that Jesus himself was righteous. See, being a Christian is not just the things that we do. Being a Christian is who we are. And we're supposed to be righteous. And we're supposed to be emulating the master and the king to all of mankind and shining as a light. And I think there's such a wonderful lesson that Jesus gave us in just the fact that he said to John, permit it for now because it is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was also baptized, though, because as John was told <clears throat> that this was going to be the one so that you would know who the Messiah really was. And so it was prophesied and told to John that this was going to be the signal of the Father's testimony that this was the Son of God, the Messiah, the one that you're making straight the paths of. And this was a new beginning, even for Jesus. We know how baptism for us is a new beginning. Behold, I make all things new. We know about those things. We, we know about if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. We know, we know those verses. But even for Jesus, this baptism with John is that way. When you go to Mark chapter 1, you see that you have a very succinct account. You have Mark starting out. John the Baptist is out there preaching in the wilderness. And Jesus is baptized of him right on that, uh, on the heels of that. And then Jesus goes out and begins to preach and to teach the kingdom himself. You have in, in Matthew's account here that you have John the Baptist baptizing. You have Jesus coming to be baptized. And you have Matthew chapter 4 with Jesus going into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and begins his ministry. And it, over and over again you see this in all the gospel accounts that this is how it begins it even says at the age of 30 he begins his ministry because that's the moment in which he was baptized. Jesus had been a carpenter, living as a carpenter and under the submission of his, of his mother and father for all those many, many years. But he was not going to go back to being a carpenter any longer. That life was over. And from that moment on, there was no longer going to be silence about who Jesus was. And there wasn't going to be doubt in people's minds who Jesus himself was proclaiming himself to be. Because at that particular moment of time, it all changed. In Mark's accounting, and I drew your attention a few moments ago to Mark chapter 1. And in Mark chapter 1, if you go back there with me once again. <clears throat> there's an interesting way in which Mark reads this that sometimes, that we miss sort of in the uh, original language. But in Mark chapter 1 and verse 10. It says, immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens, the New King James used the word parting. Some of the other versions use the word opened to him. And the other gospel accounts, it uses a different word and talks about open. The word that's used here in Mark is a much strong, stronger word than's used in the other gospel accounts. Mark only uses this word one other time, and it's in reference to when Jesus is being crucified. And the veil of the temple is opened well, yeah, it's opened, but is that really what happened? It was ripped, was it not? It was rent to signify that the access to God was now granted. And I believe that's what you're seeing here as well in Jesus' ministry in first beginning, that you have the Spirit of God who is hovering over Jesus. Jesus. 
And as Mark says, the heavens are rent open. They are torn open. And it's significant. And at that moment of time, the Spirit of God is hovering over Jesus, yes, but he's also hovering over the water. And you remember how it is that in Genesis chapter 1, at the very beginning of creation, that the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the water. And it signifies to us that this is the beginning of all new life. This is the beginning of, of things being from the very beginning, how God intends. Then in Genesis chapter 8, you have that Noah, when he's in the ark, that he sends the dove out to see if there's dry land. And it comes back because there's not any. It goes out and then it brings back, back a branch. It goes out a third time and doesn't return because it found ground. And that sp the, the dove over the water signifying that new life, new beginning, all things starting over. When Jesus is baptized and the Spirit of God is descending upon him like a dove, I think it's reminiscent of that same idea that a new way, hope, life, the way in which we live, the things that we focus on, all of that is new again. All the things that have been wrong since Genesis 3, even as we talked about around the table this morning, this is the moment of time where it all begins. And that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all there to give testimony to this very fact at the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. It's an amazing moment. Who would have thought on that day that such an event would happen as that? So it's a signal of a new beginning, but it's also to receive, as I said a moment ago, the Father's testimony about these things. The heavens are rent open. God breaks his silence and begins to talk. In Isaiah 64 and verse 1, it says this, and it's obviously, to me, a, a fulfillment of this prophecy and this request. Isaiah 64 and verse 1, the prophet says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would rip them open, that you would split them asunder, Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. And indeed, in this very calm moment that's all of a sudden upset by these events, that prophecy is fulfilled. In Isaiah 42, in verses 1 through 4, Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, <clears throat> here it says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, and whom my soul delights, just as he says, and whom my soul is well pleased. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice. In other words, he'll have grace on his tongue. Nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. In other words, there's going to be gentleness with this one. Because a bruised reed he will not break. And a smoking flax he will not quench. Notice the compassion that's going to be there. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged. In other words, there's going to be determination behind his actions. Till he has established justice in the earth and the coastland shall wait for his law. At the baptism of John, you have that declaration being made. This is the one, the compassion, the mercy the gentleness, the determination. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And yet Jesus has done nothing of his ministry. He has not healed. He has not preached a single sermon. He has not cast the demons out of anyone. He has not made the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. He has not rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees. He's done none of those things yet. The only thing that Jesus has done so far in his ministry is that he obeyed the Father in being baptized with the baptism of John that we could look at and say wasn't even needed. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. If the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are all that interested and that pleased by such a, what may seem like a very small event, then brethren, how much more so when we obey God today by simply in humility, and out of a heart of pure obedience, obey the command ourself. It's such a wonderful testimony to what the Father's pleased with. Because he takes away all the things that you used to be. And he looks forward to all the things that you can and will be. Because Jesus the Son has not yet done those things. But he's going to. When we confess Jesus as Lord in Christ... We confess him not just as our Savior, 
but we confess him as our king. We're making that pledge and entering into a covenant with God and saying, God, you have given me this salvation. I give you my entire life. I will be these things that you want me to be, and I'll strive daily for those things. There's too often that people are trying to make themselves right so that they can come to God, and that's completely backward. You will never be right until you come to God. Jesus was not even in need of what that baptism was supposed to provide for them because Jesus himself was the provider of those things. But he obeyed because that was the Father's will. To give us an example, do the Father's will, and he will be well pleased with you as well. So just to reiterate some of the uh, lessons that we talked about this morning, it is a very good lesson in new beginnings, that we can all start over, we can all start afresh, we can be those people who are made fresh again, that we can, with the baptism of, of Jesus Christ, have all of our sins washed away and start from the very beginning. It is a, a good lesson in being humble, that God in the flesh even humbled himself to subject himself to being baptized like, by someone like John the Baptist, who John said, this is not right. And yet it was humble obedience to the Father and not to John. We learn lessons in what it is that actually pleases the Father, that God does look down upon us as being a father, and he sees us as being his children, the, those created in his image. As the psalmist says, he knows that we are but dust. He knows what we're made of. He knows how difficult it may be from time to time to obey. And all he asks is for humble obedience to him. And it does please the Father. <coughs> Brethren, what a great blessing to know that God can be pleased with what we do. That's what it's about. That's what salvation is really all about. That's what living a life of righteousness is really all about. What do I need to do to please the Father? If you this morning know that you're ready to accept the Father's will for you, to trust Him for obedience, knowing that John's baptism is not the baptism we submit to, but there's so many lessons we learn from Jesus submitting to it that apply to us today, how much greater is the baptism that's offered to you this morning, Jesus' baptism, than John's? It's no longer in prospect. It's in reality. To know, as we talked about last week, we can know that we have been saved, that we are saved, that we will be saved because of what Jesus did. Let's learn from his lesson this morning. If you're subject to the invitation, you need help in any way whatsoever, please let us know as together we stand and sing the song.